Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, good evening to the Caravan Radio Club here in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and to all the uh, visitors who have uh, come to join us this evening. Uh, my name is Jerry with a G, Jerry Jurens, and my call sign is N2GJ. If you're really astute, you probably noticed that those are my initials. And no, it is not a vanity call. I earned this by learning Morse code fast enough to pass a 20 word a minute test and a very extensive amateur extra exam back in 1976 that uh, let the uh, FCC give me one of the very first end calls that they gave out. So I'm pretty happy about that. It's, I'm taking it to the grave, just so you know. Uh, anyway, I'm here to talk about QRP. QRP is a uh, Q, sign, Q sign. Uh, a lot of times people will say things like, oh, yeah, QSL, QS. And I'm, I'm not sure if they know what all those things mean, but, you know, they come into common vernacular and ham radio jargon, if you will. So QRP just means, could you reduce your power for me? Or, you know, uh, I'm going to be running low power. And by definition, uh, most people agree that QRP stands for five watts or less. Um, that's what I'm going to be running this weekend at the New Mexico QSO party all, all day tomorrow from 8 to 8, beginning in Otero County. So uh, five watts or less. Um, not going to cheat, not putting 10 watts out. I'm going to put five watts out. And uh, there's also something called QRPP, which that's all over the place. Uh, usually less might be half a watt, a quarter of a watt, whatever. Um, I've played with something called Whisper, which is a weak signal propagation reporting system from the same uh, Joe Taylor, Dr. Joe Taylor, that brought uh, FT8 and FT4 and JT65 and all those JT things uh, to our hobby. Uh, and I've run a quarter of a watt into a G5RV, and I've been heard in the Marshall Islands in Australia, New Zealand, places like that. So and that's that was from New Jersey, so a little bit further away than than even here. So uh, anyway, I'm going to talk about QRP. I'm going to talk about uh, soda sum summits on the air. Uh, can I just uh, get some sense of how many people might actually subscribe to CQ magazine? Uh, this magazine here. You can see it. CQ magazine. No. Uh, okay. Um, anyway, I wrote an article that got published last February in the QRP special. That's what this says here, QRP special. And I wrote another article uh, that was in the March issue of CQ, which will probably be here sometime before June. Um, <laughs> I heard it was uh, in the mail last weekend, so I haven't gotten my copy yet, but a number of people have gotten their March issue and they've told me they've enjoyed the article. It's the lead feature, uh, page 12 uh, in the March issue. And it features two friends uh, here in Albuquerque, George Yoakum, uh, WB5USB, and Tim Keene, uh, K5DEZ. So these are two very avid QRP summits on the air guys. We'll talk more about that a little bit later on. Okay, so that's the, the plan. Uh, told you we have uh, the uh, article here, CQ Magazine, February. Uh, it's called QRP from there to here. Uh, it talks about my history with QRP going way back to uh, maybe the 70s or so. I, I was first licensed actually in 1965 as a novice, um, but uh, didn't really get into QRP until a little bit later when I joined a group called the New Jersey QRP Club. That's uh, still out there. It's njqrp.org. And uh, it's a great club. Uh, we used to do a lot of kidding. Not, I'm not kidding you. I, I mean, we used to put kits together, packages of parts that we would mail to people that, you know, send us a couple of bucks. And um, they would build things like uh, transmitters in an Altoids tin can, those kinds of things. Uh, I'm also going to talk a little bit about some of the QRP rigs that I've owned and used, and, uh, and then specifically some New Mexico QRP operations. So uh, a couple of three years ago, I guess, I was with my uh, then fiance, uh, my now wife, Suzanne, and uh, we were at Burning Man. Um, some of you may have been there. Um, we've been there. We'll never go back. <laughs> but we were there and we were, we were in Brooke Allen's van, N2BA. Uh, Brooke and I had come all the way from New Jersey together, went up through uh, Boise, Idaho to uh, take part in a scientific experiment surrounding the eclipse of the total eclipse of the moon. 
Some of you may remember that. So we participated in that. And then we went down to uh, the uh, uh, Salt Lake City uh, area, uh, Reno area, to the Burning Man uh, Festival. And my wife flew out uh, to uh, Reno. Uh, we, picked, we picked her up from the bus stop at Burning Man. And we had the radio in the car. We played a lot of mobile, 100 watts with a 706 uh, Mark IIG icon uh, with some ham sticks, you know, nothing fancy. Worked a lot of, lot of stations on the way uh, out west. And um, what was interesting is uh, one day it was really, really hot. So I, I got Suzanne into the van, turned on the uh, engine and the uh, air conditioner, and, uh, and I started to operate a little bit of ham radio. I called CQ on 20 meters, and a guy from Silver City, New Mexico, came back to me. She says, well, you know, that's kind of interesting, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I talked to him for a little bit on Morse code, you know. And then a little bit later on, um, a guy from Tokyo, Japan, called me. So I, I said, honey, you know, that's Tokyo, Japan. So if you think about it, that's pretty far away. I'm running 100 watts. And it's kind of like if I had a 100-watt light bulb, and I and it was up on the roof of this uh, van, and it was dark out, of course. And the guy in Tokyo could see the light from my 100-watt light bulb. And she just stopped and she was like, really? I said, yeah, it's very similar. I said, light is just part of the electromagnetic spectrum, just like the radio waves that are being generated by this little box. Wow, she said, that's pretty cool. So now I got her working on her technician class. It's going to take a while, but it's a pretty good analogy, I think. What happens is, you know, I'm sitting here wherever I am, and I've got, uh, if I got a fancy antenna, I might be able to point it in a particular direction. But most of the time, I'm, I'm running antennas that are pretty omnidirectional. But, you know, those signals go everywhere. And some of them bounce off the ionosphere right above our head and come back down again. There's nobody around, so nobody cares. But, you know, sometimes it bounces far enough away in the ionosphere that you can actually, you know, be heard and actually hear somebody else coming back in the other direction. And, you know, think about it. Replace that 100-watt light bulb with a 3-watt flashlight. And you know what? It's magic. Pretty amazing stuff. There's actually groups that um, uh, talk about how many miles their signal have gone has, has gone. The signal has gone uh, based upon how many watts. So here's a guy that was located at this... Um, you can see it over here. It was located at this latitude and longitude, QRP, and he was running 10 milliwatts, okay? And he was able to work another station located at this uh, location, latitude and longitude, and it worked out to be about 202,300 miles per watt. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Do I see people shaking their head? Yeah, yeah, all right. And uh, this guy Jim Larson, he's a he's a he's big time uh, he's big time QRP guy. Lives up in Anchorage, Alaska. He's worked all states uh, with a total a total of sixty seven and a half watts. So he's kept track of how much power. Uh, basically, in the year two thousand, it was a one and a half million miles per watt. Pretty pretty crazy. Uh, if you read the FCC rules, it actually says that we should run only the power necessary to maintain the desired communications. And of course, what does that mean? You know, well, I need to be heard everywhere in Europe while I'm talking to my friend across Albuquerque. You know, uh, again, interpretation. Uh, I wish I could move this thing. Oh, there I can. Good. It's in my way. So uh, when would you want to use QRP? Well, I'm going to tell you when you wouldn't want to use QRP. If you're a brand new ham and you just got a newly minted general class license and you want to do some HF, or maybe you're a technician, you want to do something on 10 meters or, you know, there's some of the other uh, bands, there's little slices for technicians. I wouldn't, definitely would not recommend that you start with QRP. QRP can be very frustrating. Um, there's a reason that most of the transceivers that seem to be built these days are about 100 watts, okay? And that's because well, 100 watts kind of makes the ionosphere say, yeah, I'm pretty happy. I'm going to take your signal and bounce it around and, you know, get you something. But, you know, trying to deal with 5 watts or less 
could be a little bit of a frustration. So I don't recommend it for newbies, all right? Recommend it for people that are looking for a challenge and are looking to maybe build some of their own equipment. Because when you build something that's QRP, you're talking about something that's pretty small. You can throw it in a backpack, go up on the mountains, do your thing, throw a skinny little piece of wire up in a tree, if there's trees, maybe lay them on the ground or bring a little lightweight pole with you. But it, it doesn't take a whole lot, that's for sure. And um, it's a really great way to uh, improve your skills. And it's one of those things where, you know, most of the time, if you say, well, if I can hear them, I can work them, you know, that may not be the case with QRP. So there, there will be a challenge, but it is a lot of fun. I remember I bought a little radio from Elecraft. It was called the KX1. And I I'm a terrible solderer, so I got a friend of mine to build it. First QSO I made was on uh, was on 40 meters, and I just threw a wire up in the tree. It was 25 feet long, something like that, a little bit of a counterpoise, maybe 10 feet long. And it was one watt on CW, and I worked a guy in Massachusetts from New Jersey. That wasn't too bad, 40 meters, one watt, Massachusetts to New Jersey. And it's just so exciting. Wow, you know, all I did was call CQ real quick, and I got somebody. Another time, I had a Yezu uh, FT817. Some of you may be familiar with that radio. It's a uh, multi-mode, kind of really compact little thing from Yezu. It covers 160 meters all the way through four, 450 megahertz. And um, I had something they called a miracle antenna. I don't know if you ever heard of it. It's, it's basically a coaxial dipole. And I had it into an L connector on the back of the radio. My wife was in doing some shopping or something for my uh, daughter-in-law. And I put the radio up on top of the car, plugged it into the cigarette lighter and called CQ. And a guy in Asiatic Russia came back to me. Five watts. So lots and lots of stuff that, you know, can happen uh, with QRP. It's very exciting. Let me see if I can get this to work again. Okay, there we go. So uh, there's a little bit of math um, for people that uh, are interested in this kind of stuff. I'm not a mathematician. I'm an, I was an English major who ended up in IT for you know, 45 years. But basically, uh, your power uh, varies uh, logarithmically. So if, if you look at a, an S unit, you know, you have that S meter, it actually means something. It means that if you have one S unit, it's about 6 dB. And if you go from 5 to 100 watts, that's 20 times, it's 13 dB of gain. 13 dB of gain, if you do the math, is only two S units. So think about it. If I'm if I'm able to be heard with 100 watts and I'm S7, right, and I crank back the power to, say, 10 watts, I could be heard as an S5. But you still hear me, right? Am I right? You, you can you can hear me at S5. I mean, if I'm down in the mud, I'm down in the mud. Maybe 100 watts isn't even going to do it, right? If the band's really crappy, what am I going to do, right? But if if I'm if I'm at seven, and power down, I could still be heard as an S five. So it just means that you know there's very little difference between these two things. Again, if the hundred watts I'm an S one or an S two, I'm probably not going to be able to be heard, unless of course I'm running one of those fancy new flex radios. And you know, software defined radios, and they've got such a tremendous uh, ability to pull weak signals out of the air. Or if I'm using, uh, you know, one of the uh, digital modes like the FT8, JT65, things like that, they're designed to work with weak signals. So running QRP in those digital modes, man, you can really clean up. So just some other things here. This is a field day back in '88, 1200 QSOs with three radios and a pair of beams. All, all QRP. Uh, here's an 817 on top of the car. I told you these were some of the stations. Uh, friend of mine, AA3MD, over 125 countries confirmed in 24 months. He had a dipole antenna. And then this N2RE field day back in 2016, not too long ago, I brought my Elecraft KX3 on battery power and I outscored set all seven other stations total. And I was just using an NFED 40 meter long wire and they were over there, you know, side band and this and that. And the other thing I said, you know what, if I run CW and I have a simple wire antenna, I got my uh, five Watts. Uh, I can do pretty well in 40 meters. Now, New Jersey isn't quite like New Mexico. 
New Mexico, most of you probably know, is the fifth largest state in the United States. You got Texas, you got Alaska, you got a couple more, and then you got New Mexico. It's a big state. We're going to have to drive three and a half hours tomorrow to get down near Alamogordo to my first county, Otero, at eight o'clock in the morning. All right. So in New Jersey, if I drive three and a half hours, I can be to four different states. Right. So work all states eh, maybe might be a little bit easier back east. I don't know. Plus, we got all these big bumps of rock, you know, that kind of get in the way. So you have to deal with that as well. Um, my preferred mode is CW. Um, I've been doing Morse code since I was about 12 years old in the Boy Scouts. I learned it first there. And uh, when I became a ham at 15, five words a minute was nothing. But the cool thing about CW is that it's much more efficient. And I have a t-shirt that says on CW, no one can hear you scream. It's true. Anyway, the signal bandwidth for CW is only 100 hertz or so. On sideband, it's a couple of kilohertz, maybe two and a half, 2.3, something like that. So Morse actually has a much lower throughput, but the average power density is greater. So five watts of CW might be, you could make the case, equivalent to operating sideband at 100 watts. So when I get down there to Otero County, I got to make 15 contacts. If I don't make 15 contacts in each one of those counties that I said I would, I would activate, it doesn't count. I mean, the QSOs count, but it doesn't count for activating the county, if you get what I mean. Also, if I happen to get 15 contacts, guess what they give you in the contest rules? 5,000 bonus points. So conceivably, let's say, let's say out of the 12 counties that I go to, I activate 10 of them. That's 50,000 points. That's like 50,000 QSOs on sideband running 100 watts. It's pretty compelling, right? But it could also be very aggravating. I could be sitting down there calling CQ up the Gazoodie and, you know, not make my 15 contacts. But you guys are going to help me, right? You're all going to get on your radio and you're going to get on the 40-meter uh, uh, band in the morning and uh, get, get me those 15 contacts. And a little bit later in the day, we'll see how 20 turns out to be, okay? Anyway, most of my uh, QSO, uh, QRP QSOs or CW QSOs, and the same is true for George and Tim. When they go up on summits on the air, most of their contacts are CW. But they also will flip over if the signals are good, if the band is decent, you know, they'll be on 17 meters or something, 30 meters. They'll, they'll, they'll work a sideband contact. And, you know, uh, people are very grateful because not everybody does Morse code. But if you do want to do QRP in a big way, learn code. And there's lots and lots of uh, resources online for doing that. There's some tremendous organizations that are, that are just in, in business, if you will, to promote the use of uh, Morse code. Um, optimization. Uh, you know, if I'm going to take a radio up to the mountain, I'm probably not going to take my 7300 and a great big deep cycle marine battery. <laughs> I'm probably going to try to bring something that, that will fit in a very, very small package. Even my IC, I would be reluctant to take that radio up on the mountain. It's it's almost three pounds, throw a microphone in, throw a, a paddle, this, that, throw a battery in. Eh, I don't know, it, it, it's a lot. Um, but there's lots of these little mini mic type uh, uh, trans, transceivers that uh, are there both in kit form and um, already built that um, you know, folks are using, and they work really, really great. Uh, Google a guy, uh, WG0AT, WG0AT. And his, his call sign looks kind of funny when you look at it. It looks like W goat. And the reason for that is he's got a couple of goats. He's always had goats. And he takes those goats up into the mountains with him in Colorado. And he does all the 14ers. I don't know how many of them there are. There's a bunch of them up in Colorado. He does all of those. He just goes up there for the day, whatever. And his goats carry the radios and the batteries and antenna stuff and everything else, water. And uh, it's a lot of fun. He's, he's uh, legendary. His name is Steve. 
and he's WG0AT. If you really want to see uh, somebody that has optimized the, the QRP uh, operation, he's the guy. You want to have a sensitive receiver, of course. If you can't hear him, you can't work him. Um, here's a 756 Pro 3. I use this example because I actually own one. It was about 21 pounds. I had an external MFJ tuner was four pounds. I had an Astron power supply, about 50 pounds. Yeah, I carried around the trunk of the car. That would work. Uh, maybe get a pretty good size inverter, get the inverter uh, tied into the electrical system of the car. And, uh, you know, you could run that thing probably for a few hours anyway. Um, but then I could use a QRP setup. Maybe the radio is about two pounds, maybe two pounds for a tuner. And some of the QRP rigs actually have an internal tuner like the uh, Elecraft KX2 and KX3. Uh, they both have, well, even the KX1, which is uh, an earlier radio, uh, all have built-in antenna tuners. So, uh, and of course we know the antenna tuners just fool the radio into thinking it's a decent antenna, but uh, it works most of the time. So maybe you throw in a nice uh, seven amp gel cell or a bio NO battery or something like that. And maybe you're less than 10 pounds. You put that in a small briefcase or a, or a, or a backpack. Power requirements to run for 24 hours, 10% transmit, 90% receive with a conventional radio. You're probably gonna have to use upwards of 60, 65, 70 amp hours. So you're talking definitely a car battery, maybe even a deep cycle marine battery. Now, there are some guys that are going to be roving this weekend, and they're going to run 100, 100 to 150 watts uh, from the mobile. And uh, they've got some pretty nice uh, setups and everything like that. But I, I'm just using what I had. I, I, the only thing I bought was a $30 uh, inverter so that I could run the battery charger on the laptop. That's really all I'm going to use it for. I want to be able to, when the battery on the laptop starts to wind down, I want to be able to uh, to charge it up. So I've got a something that plugs into the uh, Subaru Outback's uh, cargo compartment uh, 12 volt outlet, and uh, it'll it'll run that charger uh, fine. And and before you ask, you're going to ask me, is it noisy? Do you hear it on the radio? I've I've played around with it a little bit, and I don't hear anything. So I don't know. I, I, you know, some people complain that inverters are very noisy. Um, this seems to be okay. It's a Duracell inverter, 175 watts. Okay. Um, kit building. I said uh, a lot of people build their own equipment, especially in the QRP world. Um, some folks are real good at it. I tend to pass my projects on to guys like Alan, <laughs> W2AEW. Um, you know, back in the old days when, uh, Folks actually built radios and, and uh, receivers and stuff from uh, old TV uh, sets a uh, little bit harder. And, uh, you know, tubes might be a little bit more rugged, but um, they also have a much higher uh, power requirement as well. But there's thousands of schematics that are available for, for kits, especially for QRP. Um, lots of kits uh, for single and multiband transceivers, uh, antenna tuners, filters, keyers, all that kind of stuff. Again, you can scrounge up the parts. You can buy a kit that has instructions and a, and a, and a PC board and, and some parts, or you can buy something that's already built. Of course, the most important thing in QRP, as it is in any facet of ham radio, is your antenna. So you can have the nicest transceiver, uh, lots of lots of power, all that kind of stuff. But you know what? The guy next door is running less power. He's got a better antenna setup is going to beat you out every single time. Um, one of my favorite stories is a true story. I lived in Kingston, New Jersey, which is the southernmost tip of Somerset County. And my friend George W2MTO lived up in Parsippany, which was up in uh, Morris County. And maybe, I don't know, 45, 50 miles or so. And every uh, morning, we were on the New Jersey morning net. I was the net manager and at 10 a.m. We'd be over there on CW net. And um, one day his signal was really weak. I couldn't understand it, you know, and I uh, what the heck's going on here, you know, but we were able to maintain communication and so forth. And then it wasn't until afterward, I realized that I, I had actually um, had the antenna switch uh, to my Cantana, my Heath kit dummy load, you know, basically a gallon paint can full of mineral oil in the basement of my house. So, and that was on 80 meters. So 80 meters CW Dummy load, basement, 50 miles. 
true story. So, you know, people say, oh, will it load up? Well, yeah, you know, it might load up. It might even work. Don't uh, don't don't just say, wow, you know, I got to have a 60 foot tower. You know, it's amazing what what you can do. In fact, the antenna that I'm using now is a very stealthy antenna. It's called a double extended ZEP. It's basically like a dipole that's fed with open wire feed. But, you know, the legs of it are 46 feet long. Now, if you do the math for the ham band frequencies, 46 feet ain't on no ham bands. In fact, if you use an antenna analyzer on my antenna, you will find that it is not resonant on any amateur frequency or any amateur band for that matter. In fact, the closest it comes to being resonant is about two megahertz below 60 meters. But you know what? It loads from 160 through six meters and I've made contacts on all the ends. Now it's, it's not gonna be a Yagi at 60 feet, but it's the best I can do living in the conditions that I live in. It is fed with an antenna tuner. It's an MFJ 993 BRT, which is a remote antenna tuner with a bias T that 12 volts travels down the outside of the, the uh, coax. And uh, as soon as I key the transmitter, it sends a signal down there and the antenna tuner goes <laughs> and uh, tells the radio, oh yeah, everything's great. Yeah. But the truth is it's not even resonant anywhere. So it's pretty cool. Um, but resonant antennas um, do do work uh, generally better than uh, resonant uh, than non-resonant antennas. So soda summits on the air. So the article that I have in the March CQ is about summits on the air. In fact, it's soda adventures in New Mexico. That's the lead on the cover. How do you like that? New Mexico makes the cover of CQ. So uh, anyway, it's great fun. Generally, a lot of the folks that do soda will take a single band rig, although now there's a couple of really nice commercial radios that are as, as tiny as some of the single band radios were, but they've got three or four bands in them and really nice. They'll run, they'll run all day on, a, on one of those little bio, I know, lipo batteries. And, uh, but you got to have a decent antenna, either like an end fed half wave or a dipole that's cut to the, the right length and so forth. Uh, I've been hauling these gel cells up the mountain and I'm, I'm done with that. So I, I did spring for one of these, uh, bio -Eno. the lipo batteries are a lot lighter and they have great capacity. They charge pretty quickly. Uh, they're a little more, well, no, a lot more expensive than the uh, gel cells, but they work pretty well. Uh, why would I bring pen and paper for logging? Anybody? Because I don't want to drag a laptop with me, right? If I don't have to drag a laptop, even on, you know, some of these people have little notebook uh, computers and stuff like that. It's just one more thing to have to worry about the power and, and glare coming off the sun, you know, and all that. Paper and pencil works just great. Uh, so here's the CQ magazine article for this month. I, it says April, but it was really, uh, it ended up, it was planned for April, but he got it into March. So, uh, but they've been having some problems with, um, getting the, the magazine out because of COVID they've been working from home and stuff. And it's just kind of slowed things down a bit, but anyway, SOTA, which stands for summits on the air officially began in great Britain in 2002. There's two kinds of people doing soda, activators and chasers. Activators are the people that actually go up on a mountain. And uh, folks like George, for example, will put out an email. Uh, they, these guys go about twice a, a month. And they're no spring chickens. These guys are in their 80s. I mean, they're really, they're, I can't keep up with them. And uh, Tim has a granddaughter. She's like five or six years old. She's like a mountain goat. Boop, 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 boop. And she's like a half a mile ahead of everybody on, on the way up. Amazing, but I, I, I'm like, <laughs> not even a smoker, but I'll tell you what, some of, those, some of those mountains around here are killers, I'll tell you. Uh, but anyway, uh, so he puts out an email about twice a week and uh, just two different summits. And uh, they go up there, take a bunch of pictures. Uh, they had a picture last week of a, of a bird on, on the guy's pole. He had, oh, by the way, this is my tattoo here. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, am I into Morse code or what? Oh, yeah, the shirt, too. May the Morse be with you. Anyway, a um, little humor. Anyway, um, 
So these guys go up there and they take a bunch of pictures and they work a bunch of contacts. There's a minimum number of contacts that they have to make in order to uh, you know, have a legal activation. And sometimes they'll even take two meters with them uh, and uh, make a couple of FM contacts from the, from the mountains. The other kind of people are chasers. So chasers are the folks that are reading that email and saying, oh, man, they're going to be over on such and such a mountain at 11 o'clock in the morning on uh, 7050. I'm going to I'm going to go see if I can work them. And there's there's various certificates and 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 all this uh, for people who activate lots of mountains and people who work the people that are activating the mountains. I even got one the other day from a guy in Missouri. He says, well, you know, we don't have much in the way of mountains, but, you know, we do have a couple of hills. And and because of the average terrain being what it is, they count as, as summits. So you know, it kind of doesn't matter where you live, uh, unless I guess you lived in a, a boat on the ocean, then you're kind of out of luck. <laughs> but uh, our local heroes here are George and Tim, and I mentioned them before. They really do a great job. And, and really, most of the article is about them and by them, stories uh, that they told me that I related in the article. So I hope you'll read it. Um, the magazine is also available online. And I have no pecuniary interest in CQ Magazine, um, you know, other than the fact that uh, I do and get paid <laughs> for the articles. Uh, I get no compensation for them, but I, it's a joy to write them. And it's a, it's a joy to get a, an email from somebody you haven't heard from in a long time said, you know, that was a pretty good article. I like that. Thanks. Thanks for writing it. So uh, on soda, you know, how to get started. Uh, all this stuff is in the article. Um, I told you about George's pre and post activation reports. Do you have your keys? I do. You want to say bye to Jake? Bye, Jake. Take care. <laughs> Okay, My son in law is going out and he stayed overnight with us last night. Sorry. You can edit that out, right? <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, pre and post activation reports uh, that they do and uh, lots of lots of uh, information available online. Uh, lots of suggestions on what kind of equipment to take. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's really uh, it's become a very strong part of ham radio. Um, there's, there's, uh, I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago, I think it was the hundredth anniversary of the ARRL. They had, uh, they collaborated with the national park service and had what they called NPOTA national parks on the air. Well, you know, after that was done and, and everybody was all happy that it was a, a huge success, people started doing parks on the air, just any kind of park, you know, park down the street from you or a park, you know, uh, uh, to be a national park it could be a state park it could be anything and um and so that's that's continued and and there's islands on the air and there's lighthouses on the air and there's museum ships on the air there's all kinds of things and people are you know camping out in the parking lot at the ship museum and working qrp uh to uh, activate that museum ship or whatever so lots of different variations on this theme and uh, of course there's a lot of beautiful vistas here in New Mexico and uh, just getting around to see all of this stuff is, is amazing to me being an Easterner, you know, uh, one of my friends is Ed Pochia, KC2LM. He's the uh, webmaster for the uh, uh, high desert club. He, one of his favorite things people together to do a New Mexico outback, as he calls it. And it could just be going over here to the petroglyphs or it be going up to uh, I forget this state park a little bit north of here. Um, just, you know, nice little place to sit down on a picnic table and operate for a while. And uh, we call it New Mexico Outback. We did this other thing, sort of these shale, sand shale things south of here, off of I-40. Did some of that. A couple of the guys bring uh, drones and fly them around while we're doing our thing. It's just a lot of fun to get out in the open air. Oops. Um, another uh, aspect of this is contesting. Um, lots of good operators, lots of uh, QRP only contests. There's some straight key only co uh, uh, contacts. I, I'll show you this here. This is one of the organizations in uh, QRP Century Club. There's another one over here called the Straight Key Century Club, SKCC. So I got a couple of these uh, or that a number and then you try to make as many contacts with other members and collect these numbers for fun and and uh, certificates and whatnot 
again, lots of uh, lots of fun. And of course, my favorite contest is field day. I love field day. I uh, I, I, I wish we had field day once a month. <laughs> I'd take my uh, Honda generator out to a different place every time and and I'd run 100 watts and a and an NFED antenna and I'd be I'd be in heaven. Uh, favorite thing to hear, you're running how much power? Uh, a watt. Really? No way. Way. Uh, how about VHF QRP? Absolutely. Take five watts, uh, bow, you know, the, the hated bow thing, HT. Stick it into a 20-ohm Yagi, especially around here. You can do pretty well, you know? And a lot of the equipment that's found on the higher bands, the microwave bands, as I call them, is uh, homebrewed. And a lot of it is, is already QRP. I mean, you don't really want something at 10 gigahertz. It's a, a kilowatt, especially anywhere near your body, because, you know, it could be bad. So a lot of stuff is low power. I've operated contests with Joe Taylor, uh, K1JT. But if you, if you know that name, he actually won the Nobel Prize in 1993 in physics. He's the guy that uh, discovered binary pulsars. And the software that he used that he developed was written in Fortran. And uh, it was designed to be able to pick out very, very weak signals, very, very earliest digital signal processing. And from that software is that whole plethora of, of uh, software that, uh, that we're, we've come to know and love. Okay. So, uh, but I've been at his house and a lot of his equipment, especially in the higher bands, when you work in VHF, UHF contests, you try to get somebody and then you just say, okay, go to the next band, the next band, the next band, all the way up the ladder. And uh, again, a lot of is home there's not a big market for some of that stuff you know so you have to build a lot of it yourself six meters five watts in a dipole works great we had a little local six meter contest here a year or two ago anybody remember that it was just a little kind of informal contest and i was running i don't know my kx3 on six meters and i did pretty well i think i got a certificate so it was all right uh, even more challenging is QRPP, as I said, defined as less than a watt. And uh, again, big antennas can make up for low power. I, I didn't tell you the rest of the story when I said that my half watt was being heard in the Marshall Islands and uh, Australia and, and uh, New Zealand. Uh, all right, I had a G5 RV, but these guys had gigantic antennas. <laughs> and so they could hear me, you know. It's kind of takes two to tango, <laughs> but uh, even modest antennas work pretty well. I've worked Maryland and Florida on 30 meter with just simple dipoles, 25 milliwatts. You know, it takes a little bit more for sideband. As I said, the di digital modes, perfect together. I told you about Dr. Joe Taylor. He's retired now from Princeton University. He was uh, not only a physicist, but he was also the Dean of Students. Uh, the head of the physics department he had a bunch of different uh, things. Funny, um, we had him come to our radio club uh, every year. We would do a, a radio merit badge day uh, in early January when the kids at the college were on on their uh, winter break. And uh, I talked him into coming and being our keynote speaker to the scouts. Right. We'd have 55, 60 scouts and their dads and everything, moms. And um, uh, he came and gave, gave a great talk. And, and we presented him with a plaque. And on that plaque was a radio merit badge because we had contacted the Boy Scouts and said, hey, is this guy Joe Taylor legit? I mean, did he have a radio? Yeah, he said he was in the Scouts. Did he really have the radio merit badge? They said, oh, yeah, our record, you know, we keep records all the way back. He really did earn the uh, radio merit badge. But of course, he had no idea where it might have been or whatever. You know, I, I had actually asked him. So this is what prompted us to have a, a plaque made in appreciation for him being our keynote speaker with the radio merit badge. Well, if you go to his house, you're not going to see his Nobel prize on the mantle, but you will see the plaque we gave him with the radio merit badge. Isn't that cool? So anyway, eh, not, not Dr. Taylor, just Joe, just Joe. He's that kind of guy. Anyway, there's a whole bunch of different uh, digital software uh, products that he and, and others collaborating with him have, have worked, uh, have developed and, and, and used. 
Um, just uh, I'm going to spend very little time talking about the, the actual equipment. I'm just going to flip through a bunch of pictures and stuff like that. But you can go and uh, the slides will be online. You can go and look up these things. Uh, but companies like Elecraft, Icom, the new 705, they had a 703, which was a base ORP rig, uh, IC703. You can pick those up for a couple hundred bucks uh, today. Uh, 817s are everywhere. Yezu FT 817s. Tentech has a number of new models. Uh, I was I was surprised doing my research. People say, oh, I want to buy American. I want to buy it. Well, guess what? Tentech is in uh, what, Seaverville, Tennessee. Go buy something from Tennessee or buy something from Elecraft or buy something from Flex Radio in Austin, Texas. And lots of American made uh, HF stuff. So uh, uh, and then a lot of these uh, a lot of these kits are from clubs that are here in the United States. So, uh, and some of them aren't, but anyway, lots of good stuff out there. Uh, lots of direct, some of these are older models, uh, Heathkit, HW7 and 8, Tentech Century 20. I had a Tentech Century 20, that was a fantastic radio, CW only, uh, low power, and just a fantastic receiver, full break in CW, it was great. Some other things that are out here. These are some of the new models. Uh, Tentech has the Rebel and the Patriot. So, lots of club projects. Uh, I don't know if any of you have built a Tuna Tin 40. Anybody build a Tuna Tin 40? It's a, literally a single board transmitter on 40 meters, uses a crystal, and it's, um, uh, it fits in a Tuna Tin. Just a can of tuna fish. It's kind of cool. Uh, so my photo gallery is here. I'm just going to show you some of these. This is the KX1. I I sold mine at the uh, Duke City Ham Fest. I got 400 bucks for it. So, I mean, I didn't do too badly, but I kind of miss it. It was kind of a cool radio. The only thing I didn't like about it was this part. Passive handle, uh, uh, paddle. It was didn't have a very good feel to it, but you could unscrew it, take it out and plug in any any antenna with a uh, three eighths uh, plug on it, but this was four bands. Um, you could get it with fewer bands, but I had the four band model. I think it was 80, 40, 20. And uh, I forget what the other band was. I didn't use the other band much, but it even had a, an in internal uh, antenna tuner. It used uh, six AA batteries and put out a water too. Uh, the KX2, I bought one of these. Uh, my wife actually passed away. My, uh, wife uh, Connie, she was N2 ATJ uh, back in 2013 of a brain tumor. And uh, so I got an insurance settlement and I bought a lot of stuff. And most of it I've turned around and sold. I, I was just, you know, sometimes grief makes you do stupid things, <laughs> but I bought a lot of stuff. This was one of the things I bought. And you know what? I, I didn't really like it because I was so used to the KX3 that I'd had for seven or eight or nine years then. I still have it. It's probably 12 or 13 years old now. Uh, the menu system was different, the, the the feel of it. It has a built-in microphone, so you can kind of walk around with a wire dangling behind you and operate, you know, sideband or whatever. Uh, it just, I don't know, I didn't get a lot of use out of it. I sold that. I sold the, uh, they had a PX3, which is a uh, pan adapter too. This is my KX3, and it shows you with the pan adapter. Again, didn't use it much. Uh, I had the flex radios, which... Uh, um, you know, we're all, you know, software defined radios with waterfalls and all that. I just didn't use it much. And again, and again, it's got that, uh, that paddle thing, uh, which uh, I think they call it the KPD three or something. I, I just didn't like the look and feel of it. I like my Benger and yeah, it weighs a couple of pounds and I got it, got it in my backpack, but it's just, it just fits. They also have a hundred watt amplifier called the KPA 100, which I had sold. This is my newest radio. It's on the floor over there, ready to go in the car tomorrow. Uh, 160 meters through 70 centimeters, all mode. Five watts with the uh, internal uh, battery. The, well, it's kind of a clip on the back battery uh, from the ID51A. It's just a handy talkie battery, literally like 1200 milliamp hours or something. And uh, if you, if you put, plump, pump in uh, 12 volts from outside, it, you can get 10 watts out of it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run off the internal battery until it doesn't work anymore. And then I'm going to use my external batteries. I have a couple of those. 
and I'm going to turn the power down to 50%. So I'll, I'll, I'll continue to run five watts, even though I could conceivably run 10. Uh, it's a real bright screen, works really great. One knock on it is there's no internal antenna tuner. And uh, they just come out with something called the AH705 ICOM, but it's like $500. I mean, this thing is already almost $1,500. So that's a lot of money. And you can get a lot of antenna tuners for a whole lot less money. Um, Bob Longoria and I have these uh, LDG Z100 Plus. They're great. Throw, I don't know, eight double A's in them and they run forever. Nice little antenna tuners. Um, oh, this looks like a. Is this the kit that I gave you, Alan, or is this a different one? <laughs> I don't know. No, that's not the one I got here for you. No, I don't think mine has a screen. I think mine was just a, a beacon. But anyway, this is a. Uh, they call it QRSS, uh, which is a really slow speed CW. Uh, operates a variety of other modes, and um, uh, it's it's pretty fancy. It's also pretty expensive. Here's a, you know, a couple of home-built things uh, from kits in Altoid tins, including the 9-volt battery. There's a quarter just to give you some sense of the size. These happen to use uh, crystals, but there's some that are you know, VFOs. 250 milliwatts. NorCal 38 Special. This is an oldie but goodie. It's been there forever. N2APB is George Heron. Uh, he was the founder, one of the co-founders of the uh, New Jersey QRP Club, and he he just he, he's a mad scientist when it comes to designing radios, and he's come up with all kinds of designs. And you can see a lot of the stuff that that the club uh, developed uh, based on his and Joe N two CX, who's now Silent Key, uh, their designs. There's some really good stuff. I don't know if any of that stuff is still available at all, but uh, all of the uh, software and all of the um, um, schematics and so forth are available to anybody. You can get, you know, parts from DigiKey and places like that, uh, Mouser, and uh, build it up yourself. Small Wonders Lab. This is from, um, I forget his name, uh, developed a whole bunch of different things. He's, he's been around a million years. Uh, just his brain fog. Uh, forgot his name. Is that Steve uh, Weber? Steve Weber. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, he's a uh, uh, solder smoke and so forth, right? Anyway, he uh, he's built, designed a whole bunch of different things. And this is a, a two watt, 40 meter CW transceiver. This is one for sideband. This is another little fancier, nice big knob on it, an S meter. Ooh. Nice thing about some of these things, you can build them for a fraction of the cost of what a new, uh, you know, fancy dancy 705 will cost. You could build, probably build, I don't know, I was gonna say six or seven of them. This is a 40 meter, two watt transceiver. This is Steve Heidig, OHR four bander. Now I haven't used all of these radios. I'm just, I research, I put this together. Uh, to to find examples uh, that would give you some ideas, and you could follow up on these things. I don't I don't have all of these, but I do have experience with many of them. This is uh, my old, uh, very much like the Century Twenty One, a little fancier. This is a new radio from Tentec uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, Tentec Five Hundred Seven. It's Arduino based, so it's got some software defined capabilities. Uh, Yezu upgraded these 817. I've never had one of the 818s. I've, I've actually owned four 817s. <laughs> bought them, sold them, bought them, sold them. Um, but the, uh, the 818, they boosted the power from five watts to six watts. Do the math. Uh, but it's a, it's really a nice little radio. My, my biggest complaint is the buttons are really, really tiny and I got fat fingers and it's really, it was hard for me to work the, uh, the little menus. As a, this is an oldie but goodie. I'll bet a lot of folks got started with a radio like this back in the day. This is the tuna tin I was telling you about, a little less than a watt. It's from W1FB. He was uh, one of the guys at W1AW, uh, ARL. The Herring Aid receiver. 
uh, notice the parts from Mouser. I don't have it here, but um, there was uh, during the um, uh, QSO Today Ham Expo, the virtual Ham Expo, there was a build-a-thon, and one of the projects was a 20-meter uh, transmitter. And um, I've I've got the kit, I've got the schematics. I just haven't built it yet, so it's it's on my to-do list. A couple of uh, different kinds of portable paddles. This is called a rainbow tuner. This was one that the uh, New Jersey QRP Club built. Um, this is a, I don't know, can you guys see this? Can you see what I put on here? This is uh, called a, uh, uh, Ellicraft calls this a W1, I think it is. It's a little watt meter, power meter, and it tells you how much power you're running based upon the number of LEDs that are lit. I think my fingerprints are on that one. You, you don't like my solder? Look at the good solder I did here. Look, it's gorgeous, huh? <laughs> yeah, I think your DNA is on it, uh, Alan. Uh, this is uh, a rainbow tuner. This is something else with a nice little box around it. This is a field stack that he put together one day. It's got the transmitter, the receiver, the paddles, and a, uh, a power amplifier, I guess. Here's a, uh, it's called the frequency mic. It uses a PIC microcontroller. Miniature paddles. Uh, Alan showed you one of his miniature paddles a little bit earlier. It's another one. This is real pretty. NorCal. This is, uh, this is similar to the one I was telling you about. This is from White Rook. So it, the one I have has this on one side of it and this on the other side of it. And it weighs... I don't know, a fraction of an ounce, hardly weighs anything at all. Great for power, portable use. A um, couple of portable antennas. Uh, this was N2CX, as I was talking, oops, sorry. N2CX, uh, Joe uh, designed this one. It was a 40 meter half wave end fed with a quarter, quarter wave uh, counterpoise. Uh, there's something called the St. Louis Vertical, which uses collapsible fishing poles. This is a picture of it. It's basically uh, uh, a vertical with a trap. This is Joe N2CX. He was a great guy. Um, very brilliant engineer. Worked for L3 and before that Lockheed Martin and so forth. Um, was on a business trip and uh, got a call from the police department. His house had burned down, killed his wife and his uh, dog. Uh, very, very sad. And he just was quite never quite the same uh, after that. And he ended up um, falling ill and, uh, and passing away. But uh, what a brilliant, what a brilliant designer, what a, a very loving and giving person uh, in our hobby. Great guy. Lots of QRP uh, publications. Uh, I, I subscribe to the QRP quarterly from ARCI, ARCI. These guys uh, uh, also do something at the Dayton Ham Vet, and they call it FDIM, four days in May. And they collect all these QRP aficionados together and uh, tell war stories and share designs and things like that. Some other QRP websites. This is uh, New Jersey QRP. Uh, again, why QRP is uh, simple uh, radio, simple, you know, lightweight battery, um, some simple lightweight wire, um, really thin coax. You don't have to worry too much about, you know, uh, like if you use an RG174, which is really, really tiny stuff, you don't have to worry about uh, it on 80 meters or 40 meters. I mean, if you're going to use it on two meters, yeah, you might worry. You don't have to worry so much about the loss uh, in the lower bands. So lighter, easy to carry, lots of fun. It's also safer. I, you know, we're so, actually the FCC sort of requires us to do an analysis of our operation to see if it's safe from an RF uh, perspective. And uh, if you start now with a tiny bit of power and a simple antenna, it's not likely that it's going to, you know, be a health hazard to anybody. Less QRM, lots of fun. Working in the suite on 100 watts is easy. One watt, it's pretty cool. So here's some of the other clubs. NorCal, New Jersey QRP. 
Arky. This uh, do a lot of stuff in England. You know, again, they started the soda, uh, or the, well, I don't know if they started it, but they created an organization around soda. So there's a lot of activity there in QRP. Uh, I told you about my articles, so look those up if you'd like. There's a couple of books that are out there that are that are good, and you can you know just Google QRP books, and you'll find lots of stuff out there. So there's a couple of people I wanted to remember. I, I told you about George and Joe. Uh, a friend of mine, John DeGood, NU3E, is uh, a member of the uh, David Sarnoff Radio Club that I'm still a member of. He uh, he built me a 40-meter uh, end fed antenna with a 68 to 1 ballon or some crazy thing like that one year for field day. And that was the one that I, uh, you know, got more points than all the other stations. Uh, of course, George and Tim. And my buddy Bob Longoria, N5JH, our very own uh, uh, master uh, uh, operator here, uh, he actually reviewed my presentation for me and gave me some suggestions, et cetera. So I wanted to include him in my acknowledgments. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll take any questions that you might have. Hey, Jared, uh, Alan, I just uh, you mentioned that, uh, you know, one of the uh, um, QRP kit makers uh, that has some really excellent kits, a guy named Hans Summers, uh, QRP Labs, uh, and some of the, like the, some of the single bander, you know, CW transceivers are like $55, like for the QCX Mini and QCX uh, Plus, like $55, you know, single band uh, CW transceivers, you know, five watt, four or five watts, which are just fantastic. I'm actually in the middle of building the QCX Plus right now. So looking forward to getting that one on the air. What's the difference between the QCX and the Plus? Uh, the, the, the QCX Plus is, it's in a um, kind of a rectangular case with a front panel where the original QCX was kind of a laid down flat and had a little micro switch key on it. So the, the plus mm -hmm. kind of puts it in a little bit more of a traditional type front panel type case. And then the QCX mini lays it back down again, but without the little paddle on it. So, but they're basically the same, all three of those are basically the same design, just different physical configurations of it. Gotcha. Thank you for that. Very good. But like for 55 bucks, you know, it's pretty amazing. I can't beat it. Transceiver. Transceiver. CW yeah. transceiver. It doesn't come with a case, but you can get a case from even if you get if you get the case that he recommends, which is all silk screen printed aluminum extruded case. It's still less than a hundred bucks total. Mm -hmm. Cool. So I'm I'm kind of curious. Uh, how many of you out there have uh, experienced uh, QRP and or soda activities? Peter Spots. Okay. Anybody else? Christopher, well, Christopher does his QRP from the mountain every morning. <laughs> yeah, I, I date back from uh, I, my first uh, QRP rig was in 78 when I built the HW8. Okay. And it was, it was an interesting conversion in that I had a beautiful year-old Tempo 1 I'd gotten as a novice. And, you know, I was back one year up or out. So I went up. That's right. Um and I went to a local ham radio club once with a guy named Jim Hatherley, who was my Elmer for CW, was in the Merchant Marine during World War II. Um, and um, the man was amazing. Uh, but he gave a talk on Morse code. Because I was, you know, once I was done with the novice license, I didn't want anything to do with Morse code. And then he came up with that, that comparison that you, this, you know, similar to the slide you showed, where basically five watts of CW will communicate the same amount of information, not at the same pace perhaps, but maybe it does because if the conditions aren't good, you're, you're listening to one Donald Duck trying to talk to another Donald Duck. And if it's down near the noise floor, good luck, where all you're listening for with CW is a tone going on and off. But in any event, so I sold the Tempo One and for the next, oh, I guess it would have been five years. I was QRP only. Mm -hmm. And then kids came along. And so it, it wasn't until, you know, afterwards I got, but it was, and, and I found that there were, and more so today than there were back then, there are so many QRP activities that it is, I think it's probably easier 
and certainly less expensive for a newbie to get involved if they want to learn Morse code now than it was back then. Yeah. Uh, just because almost every month, if not, you know, there's something going on that in, that has either is dedicated QRP or has a QRP category in it. And you don't have to take contesting seriously, but there are a lot of other folks out there who want your contact. Mm -hmm. So even though you may be down close to the, the noise floor, you know, if they're hurting for contacts and it's kind of in late in the evening and they're not getting anything, you know, you, you could, it's, it's a good way to go QRP, worked all states, worked all continents, you know, that sort of thing. In a weekend. So, yeah, in a weekend. Yeah. Absolutely. Very good. Anybody else? Questions, comments? You had mentioned the 703. That's, uh, that's, the, that's the rig that I normally use yeah. uh, going out. That's the 703. It looks just like the 706, physically the same size as the 706, but it's got the tune that the 706 doesn't have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I never owned a 703. I had a 706 in the uh, was age four tuner or whatever, which is a big monstrosity. You know, you put it up on the roof of the of the van. You know, when you run your uh, tuner. Yeah. And I think that extra band on the KX1 is 30 meters, 80, 30, right. yeah, 40, and 20. I think 20. Yeah, 80, 30, 40, and 20. I I'll tell you what. I ran the uh, CW net uh, on 35, 44 quite a few times running uh, one uh, on 80 meters with it. Yeah. It worked great. Had a little digital readout, real simple. Yeah. Cool stoke. Thanks, Jerry. Great okay. Well, thank you very much for having me. And um, I look forward to uh, uh, if you have any questions or, uh, you know, comments, uh, if you want to send them after this is over, uh, it's just my call sign at ARL.net will work. So n2gj at arrl.net. And again, thank you for your attention. And I, I love the opportunity to have uh, talked to you guys today. Thank